Okay, so we got to take care of some official business here. I just turned on the recorder. Uh, everybody say hi. Hi. All right, that way it sounds. There, yeah, easily. Um, today is June thirtieth. All right, it is two thirty. This is excelling in your career, going pro. Uh, my name is John Glinsky, uh, and I am going to be teaching this class with some of my best friends. Uh, my uh, my best wife, best my best best friend is my wife, Carol Glinsky. Uh, and then uh, a couple that is also some of our best friends here, Marcos and Leslie Esparza. Best best, um, best friends. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, we wanted to, to share this class uh, so that we didn't have to write as much. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Because uh, we wanted to share this class because, uh, honestly... It, we're all friends. We all actually were in the same campus ministry together uh, just a few short years ago uh, back here at the University of Texas. Um, so I was, I was slaving away in, in the electrical engineering department uh, those years. I became a Christian here. I was a uh, tall, skinny, uh, long-haired bass player in a heavy metal band. Um, and... Uh, what's that? Yeah. Uh, so I was I was reached out to uh, by Brian Aiken, who was uh, Brian Aiken, who was uh, he was a math major. He was leading the campus ministry here. A, a church had just been planted about a year before, and the Hoopers, uh, Dave and Angela, had just moved here. Uh, but uh, shortly thereafter, uh, Leslie moved down from New York uh, to study theater, uh, and then uh, my wife moved from the San Antonio church. Uh, to also study engineering. Yeah, that's right. We, we, she was not my wife at the time, but that's how we met. Uh, and then somewhere along the way, uh, Leslie invited Marcos to, uh, to church. And, uh, we, that's right. <laughs> so, uh, and then I, me and some of the guys studied the Bible with Marcos. He was baptized here in, in the campus ministry. What year? What about? 2001. 2001. Okay. Wow. So, yeah, so I was class of 2000. I guess I was, I was graduated at that time and leading the campus ministry here with Carol. We were married in 2001. Um, so, uh, anyways, part of what we wanted to talk about was just, ex- we want to focus on excelling your career, but what we, why we wanted to have four people was that excelling your career happens in many different ways. And there's not necessarily going to be a formula, but what we can do is we can offer you some principles to keep in mind. Uh, as you uh, go forward into the great unknown, I think this is a class that most people were were scared to attend because you, you don't want to admit that you're actually leaving the campus ministry here at some point. Um, I tried to avoid that by going into the campus ministry leadership uh, for a couple of years, um, but uh, I'll get into the details of that. I wanted to start off with just one point here uh, today, and, and I'm going to take it from Psalm 37. So if you guys want to uh, scroll over there. Then uh, you can join me in Psalm 37, verse 1. It says this, Do not fret because of those who are evil, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass they will soon wither, like green plants they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and endure, enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him and He will do this. He will make your righteous rewards shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be patient, uh, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. So, basically what I wanted to talk about here is just the number one way to excel in your career is to, de- to be dedicated to God. So, as it says here in verse uh, 5, it says, Commit your way to the Lord and trust in Him and He will do this. He will make your righteous... Uh, he will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn and vindication like the noonday sun. See, when you dedicate your life to God, then God looks out for you. And I know that you've, you've probably heard this, for those of you who grew up in the church, you've probably heard this all the way from uh, you know, Kids Kingdom on forward, that, that you, you, you commit yourself to God and let God take care of you. you know, Jesus says this in, in, in a number of different ways. Uh, but the main point is that what you do, be dedicated to God. Because you don't really know what's going to happen. And you don't want to be short-sighted and say uh, that, that you need to take care of your business first and put God second. 
I mean, number one, that's short-sighted in the, in the realm of eternity. But number two, it's just short-sighted in that you're not giving God the opportunity to bless you. And I say this because, you know, it also says, you know, don't worry about the success of worldly people and don't be tempted to compromise. Uh, because whenever I, whenever I look back on my career, I was, I was in the electrical engineering department here at UT. Uh, I was actually an officer in, in probably the nerdiest society of, of, uh, of UT. It was IEEE Computer Society. Um, and uh, basically, I was, I, I, it was at actually hanging out with those guys that I realized I was not meant to be an electrical engineer. It was one of those Mondays I came in and everybody's, you know, uh, typing away, doing their, their thing on, on whatever, and people are like, hey, what'd you do this, this weekend? And, you know, I had gone to the campus Devo, we hung out with some friends, I don't remember exactly the details, but the guy starts saying, oh yeah, the new version of Red Hat Linux came out, and I installed it on this machine, and then I had all these problems with the driver, so I had to download this, and I was like, oh my goodness. <laughs> this is what you guys did for fun, this weekend. I'm in the wrong career. And, um, but that was actually, what's that? Triple E's over here. Oh yeah, that's true. We got, we got some. nerding. Hey, nerding is a, is a good is a good career. Um, so uh, I, I'll get to that because the thing is, although I realized I didn't necessarily have the same desire to do what they did, I, I had got it already kind of planted the seed in my heart to want to go into the ministry at that time. But I also knew that I, I wanted to finish out my electrical engineer, electrical engineering degree. I wanted to be excellent in that because I probably was the only person that graduated. Uh, from the engineering department whose engineering degree was a fallback plan um, because at that point I went into the ministry and it was it was difficult in many different ways number one um, you know my family did not support me uh, my family was not a family of, of disciples and so uh, telling them you know there I was the youngest I had two older siblings that each kind of pursued uh, liberal arts careers. My brother ended up as a bartender. My sister ended up with like $100,000 in student debt and took a $10,000 a year job. And, you know, these kinds of things. My parents were looking at me going, this is the one, this is the golden child that's going to, uh, you know, actually get a good career. And I was like, hey, I'm going to go work in the ministry and barely pay my bills. And, um, you know, it didn't go over well. But I was dedicated to God. And then... You know, I got to, to do it here at UT for about a year and a half before we were asked to move to Los Angeles, which was not what I wanted. You know, I wanted to be here. Uh, I loved Austin. I loved the campus ministry. But, you know, amen, God, I, I'll, I'll, I'll be dedicated. I'll do whatever you want. And honestly, I like, there was a lot of cool places I wouldn't have mind moving to and living. L.A. was probably at the bottom of that list. Uh, no offense to the Orange County people. But just kind of growing up here in Texas, I liked countrysides and, and, and open space and like from what I'd seen on you know educational materials of movies and TV shows, that LA didn't really look like a place I wanted to be. But I actually I got there and I loved it. You know I, I fell in love with the church there. I fell in love uh, with the state of California, and uh, you know I was really getting into it. And then a year later we were laid off from the ministry, um, and so here we were with no real savings because in the ministry you don't get to save much up, and you know, now we're in one of the most expensive cities in the world. And, uh, you know, just trying to figure out, okay, God, what, what have you done? Like, where, where am I? And so, in the end, we just prayed. And, uh, you know, my wife just took a temp job. And I literally, I had worked construction for years. Uh, I grew up in Galveston, Texas. So I, I was building beach homes in, during the summers. And I put those skills to use as working with a handyman who was in my ministry. And honestly, it was, it was a great, like, five, six months uh, of just testing my faith. Like I, I look back on it now and go, man, that was great. But man, there were some dark days there, just kind of wondering, God, you know, what happened? Because I got, I, I got, I pulled all the strings I could. Every, every uh, engineer in the church was like, hey, I'll get you a job interview. I'll get you a job interview. But everybody had looked at my resume and go, wait, you graduated three years ago and haven't done any engineering since then. And it just, like, they were not. There was a, it was a hard pass at that point. You know, I, I basically was just. Uh, I, I did some really dirty jobs from like busting up concrete to uh, clearing construction sites of dead pigeons and pigeon poo and all that kind of stuff. Long stories I can tell you some other time. But, you know, it's definitely one of those prodigal son moments when you're scraping up like pigeon poo with like a, a snow shovel and you're going, God, wh wh what am I doing here? You know, um, but I was I was dedicated to God. Whatever I do, I'm going to do it well. Yeah. And so uh, that's where. Uh, right about the time when we were running out of all of our money, even our temp jobs weren't able to, to continue to, to pay the bills, and we were like considering, okay, now it's time to move back to Texas, move in with your parents, and try to you know apply for jobs and, and all that kind of stuff. Right at that point when we were you know at the end of our rope, that's whenever God gave me a, a job in a software company. 
And fast forward a few years, that software company eventually allowed me to move back to Austin um, and, uh, and basically work from home on a California salary. Uh, one of the things that ended up happening as well was that whenever uh, I was there, uh, they, that, that company had to go through some layoffs as well. But I, I remained because I was one of the, the more dedicated, hardworking professionals in my, in my group. I will tell you this, though. I put God first even whenever I was there. I made every midweek, uh, partly because I was preaching at those uh, still. Um, but, you know, I, I, I was there every Sunday. I didn't, I didn't, I, if I worked late hours, it was because I was okay to do that. I didn't miss devos. I didn't miss whatever, uh, you know. There was one time I missed a Bible talk, but that was because I was stuck in traffic for three and a half hours. But, um, but that's L.A., you know, that's, that, that happens. Um, so... There was even one time when the uh, the guy that was basically the running the company, um, his name was Bob, and I, the first time I met Bob was the first week I was there. Uh, there was a big crisis, and all the the big brains of the company were in a conference room, and I was my department was there to try to help mitigate the customer uh, issues, and like all these guys, these professional guys are just you know, cussing each other out and, you know, going, they're all, uh, you know, totally worked up. And, you know, Bob at one point looks at me and goes, it's like this every day. And, uh, and he was, he was half joking, but it, it, it was, he was an intense guy. Everybody was, was scared of Bob, but I actually had to work with Bob on a couple of trips. Uh, we went to, to clients and he saw my work ethic. He saw that I was dedicated. And, um, then one, one day he came by, I was sitting in my, my manager's office and, uh, he said, Hey guys, this is big. He said, Hey John, there's a big problem with LabNet. This is one client that he and I had worked on. And he's like, we're going to be here long, uh, all night tonight. I was like, can't, I got, I got a uh, church tonight, but I'll come back afterwards if you want. And he said, mm, no, nah, you're fine. Just check in in the morning. I said, okay. And I turned and like my manager and the other guy in my department were there with like their jaws, like wide open that I just told Bob, no, thanks. And because like these guys had all done all nighters at the company and, and all that stuff. And I was like, no, you know, church is, is, is important. And in the end, both those guys were gone after the layoffs and I was still there. Wow. So I, I say this and, and partly it's because, you know, I was, I was one of the cheaper employees, but <laughs> partly because I feel like I, you know, I trusted in God and God had given me that job. You fast forward the, the few years to where, uh, to where we are now. I now run my own software company. Uh, I've got uh, I've got four employees, and uh, I basically get to make my own hours. My wife and I we lead the team ministry here uh, in the Austin Church, and uh, and it's a lot of fun. But it's also I mean it's a, it's a lot of hard work. And I look back and I go, if I had not chosen the faithful route, the dedicated route, uh, I had I literally had a job offer at an engineering firm here in Austin. Uh, whenever I told them no thanks, and I went into the ministry and took about half the salary. And there was definitely times whenever. Uh, whether it was moving back to Austin and, and couch surfing at the Esparza's house when, when we had nowhere to live uh, or, you know, being laid off in L.A. and not knowing where our next paycheck was going to go, that I stopped and I wondered, you know, God, what if I had just gone into engineering? Because apparently that's where I'm supposed to be. But if I had, I'd still be working for that engineering company right now. Uh, I actually did get an offer from them when I was moving back, and I realized that where I would be making, uh, like what I would be making for them is about half what I'm making now. Um, and, and I don't say that to brag. I say that because from a purely financial, a purely professional standpoint, if you look at it without the faith, like I was much better off moving to L.A., getting the connections, getting the experience that I got out there, and using that to build my business now because I would not have the business I have now if I hadn't gone faithfully out there, gone through that hard time of being laid off and just being dedicated to God the entire time. So at this point, I'm going to actually call my wife up, and she's going to talk about uh, her next point. Okay, so my name is Carol Gunski. I'm married to John. Um, and that whole story moving, obviously I was there. Um, so, but I, I kind of want to talk a little bit about what I do now. So now I actually own a business as well, and um, I teach and train people to do the same thing that I do. So um, if you have more questions, we can talk about that later. But um, basically, I've learned a lot of, a lot of things through that. Um, but a lot of things just by being in the ministry, going out of the ministry, getting a job, all the stuff that kind of go entails into all of that. Um, but I will definitely say the, the thing, there's a, a few specific things that really stick out to me um, that are super important. So Colossians 3, 23, it says, uh, whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. 
And I think this is probably the biggest thing that, that I can say, if you want to excel, work like you're working for God. Because, you know, you guys are going to go and you're going to have bosses, and some of them are going to be great. And some of them are not going to be great. <laughs> um, you're going to have great bosses, not so great bosses, right? But what you can do is that you always know that you're working for God. The end boss is really God. And so whatever you do, it will be noticed. And it may you may go through a time where it's like desert and you're like, this is terrible. But you, if you really, if you dedicate and you give it to God, it's gonna, it, it'll turn out well. Um, so there's a few specific things that I'd love to share with you about consistency. So there's a book that I read, um, and you should all read it if you want to. You should read it. Anyway, okay. It's called The Slight Edge, and it's by Jeff Olson. But it's a great book about just consistent um, daily practices, right? Um, so you might be like, what's that? What does that have to do with it, right? Um, actually, in the book, it's really funny because he talks about um, how you, like, little by little, you add to your... To, to, to things in your life, right? But and in Proverbs 13 and verse 11, and this just says something very small, um, but it says, dishonest money dwindles away, but whoever gathers money little by little makes it grow. Mm -hmm. And it's just a general concept of mm -hmm. adding things little by little. And sometimes I feel like you might be looking for like, I'm going to make the big break and I'm going to like be a millionaire in like one second, right? Um, but no, if you have a character that adds things little by little, whether it's money, whether it's time, whether it's friendships, like all these different things, it's a huge character um, quality that, that God wants in us. Um, and so in this book, he talks about there's so many things that are super easy to do. So for instance, can you, can I get a show of hands like who makes their bed every single day? Whoa. Okay, that's pretty impressive, right? I read this book, and that's like one of the first things in the book. He says, do you make your bed every day? And I was like, no, because sometimes I'm like, it doesn't matter, because if I don't make it, then I just get back in the bed, and it's like the same that it was before, right? Okay, and that's the, I have children, and my kids say the same thing. They're like, why do I have to make it? I'm just going to mess it up. Okay, <laughs> this is true, right? Um, but the difference is um, that the little things in your life, make up the big things in your life. Yeah. And these little disciplines in your life are huge. So, for instance, I could say, is like you making your bed gonna matter in the end? Like if you don't make your bed today, like in your life, the, the span of your life, will that matter? No, right? Um, but if you make your bed every single day, it's gonna grow something in you that's deeper than just making your bed. So I will, so basically, one of the best things that he said is what's easy to do is also easy not to do. So think about that, like in your life. Okay, if I do this, will it matter? Like if I go, if I get to work on time, will it matter? Nobody's going to notice today. Big deal, right? If you're still in class, will it matter if I go to my class every day? No, because the professor doesn't take you know, doesn't look at, take attendance for anything, right? Um, so does it matter? No. Like that one little thing won't matter, but all the little things do add up. And that's how it works in our life. Let's take dieting for an example, right? Like if you're like, okay, well, no big deal. I'm just going to eat this cake. Okay, you eat this cake and it's like 300 calories. Does that make you fat? No. <laughs> that doesn't make you fat. But if you consistently, if you every every meal you have a piece of cake, uh, yeah, right? So there's this, I'm going to show you this little, so this is kind of the, the little thing here, right? So if you if you make choices that that take you, you know, to, to go up, then that's awesome, right? You have to build, those little disciplines build. And then if you make choices, you're like, it's no big deal. I don't need to make my bed. I don't need to be on time. I don't need to be this. Right, all those things make like make you go to the failure to the failure scale, scale or whatever, right? And ninety five percent of the people in this world choose this. Five percent choose this, and that's what makes them successful. Not because they're like the smartest people, because you will find successful people that are not as smart, mm -hmm. not as talented, but just dedicated. And so, if you can be dedicated, that's huge. So, daily discipline is a big deal. Um, I think another thing is just to be skilled at what you do. So in Proverbs 22 and verse 29, it says, <clears throat> Do you see someone skilled in their work? They will serve before kings. 
they will not serve before officials of low rank. Um, so, adding to your skills often, reading. Okay, I, like yes, you need to read the Bible. Okay, you need to read. Um, you need to read these other things, but you need to read other books too. There's amazing knowledge out there that you can learn. Grow in your knowledge. There's some people that are so successful, but the great thing is that you have is you have the foundation of God's word so that you can skim out the things that you're like, yeah, that's not good, but this is a great practice. And so you know what is right, and you can add to that. Um, so I just want to tell you a little story about um, me and in this. Okay, so how many of you guys have liberal arts degrees? They're graduating liberal arts. Okay. Cool. Not that many. I was... Anyway, all you people that are listening, <laughs> if you have liberal arts degrees. So I will tell I started off as an uh, engineer as well, um, and I quickly moved my way out of there because I was like, whoa, I am not an engineer. Um, but I, I became a psychology major, right? So I graduated psychology, and that is awesome. Yeah. But guess what? When you graduate with a psychology degree and you don't get a master's, guess what you do? Nothing. <laughs> um, and the honest truth is that a lot of you guys may be going and graduating and feeling like, I don't have, like, what am I going to do? I can't use what I studied, like I studied all these years to, to do, right? So we went in the ministry. I was able to use some of that. But then we got out of the ministry. I have to get a job, right? So I'm looking. I got a temp job at this place. And um, so I worked hard. I, I did a good job. I was there in time. I talked to people. I did all this stuff. And I was like an administrative assistant. What is that? Like, that's like the lowest of a low of, you know, any job. Like, you're like a secretary, right? So I'm like, okay, that's cool. Whatever. I'm going to do this. So I'm getting, I'm getting a small paycheck. But I kept on working hard. Kept working hard. By the, probably like the second month, she had hired me as a full-time um, but then I became a, um, the, the manager of the office. Um, I didn't get paid for this, by the way. But I, got, I became the manager of the office. I became the executive assistant to the, like, to the exec there. I became uh, an assistant to the, all three other salespeople there. And, and, and I was still doing the administrative assistant job, right? Okay, so I'm doing five jobs, which I will say, like, so if you work hard, people will notice it and they'll give you more things to do. So don't be lazy and be like, I don't want that, right? <laughs> but if you do well, you will serve before kings. I met like all these amazing people. I met celebrities. Like I talked to people because I'm working with this, this lady that knows all these people, right? Um, but the crazy thing was, I, you know, we had a baby, we we're going to move back, and I was like, I'm done because it's also crazy, okay? So um, I was happy to be gone from that job, but when I was leaving, she was willing to more than double my salary. So if you do what you do, whatever you do, do it well. My grandma used to always tell me this, but she was like, hey, look, not everybody is going to be super smart, but if you're going to be, you know, a, a, the garbage man, be the best garbage man you, that you can be. Um, if you're going to be like um, a rocket scientist, be the best rocket scientist, right? Like there's all these, we all have different talents that God's given us. So whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart. So um, I will say that, that probably one of the biggest things too is just reading and learning and growing, adding to those skills. Have conviction about your life, about what you do, and it will be very noticeable to people. So um, yeah, that's about it. You're going to finish off the video. You should clap. That was awesome. So, uh, we had candy. Wait a second. Let me throw one out. I, I, I sold it. I said we had candy. Oh. Woo! Well, everybody, see, everybody jump for it. Look, you, you can't tell people not to eat cake at every meal and then start throwing out candy. Um, so, anyways, I, I appreciate uh, what, what Carla did to say. And, and I just wanted to just kind of reiterate that. What you do, add a little bit every day. You know, don't get overwhelmed by, I mean, I call it like the, the clean the kitchen mentality. You can walk into a kitchen, it can be completely disgusting, but, and you think, there's no way I can clean this thing. Just start with a dish, you know, just do one. Like, start putting stuff in the dishwasher. Just start doing one task at a time. It's the same thing with your career. You may go, I'm never going to get where I want to get. Then just start with a job. And do your best job at that job. So, um, and do it because you're doing it for God, not not for you, not for whoever hired you. But do it well, and God will see that. God will will vindicate you, and uh, and will bless you because of that. So at this point, I'm gonna call up Marcos and Leslie, uh, or I guess Marcos first, right, to uh, to share his next point. Awesome. Thanks, John. Got my camera on.
So I got a degree in theater and dance at the University of Texas, so, so I'm going to be a lot more animated than these guys, uh, but a lot less dumber with my words and my, and my speaking ability. See, just exactly, I can't even phrase a sentence correctly, but, but I want to I talk about the thing that I'm passionate about, and that's fear. And, and not necessarily, I'm passionate about fear, but overcoming fear. So I want you to guys, actually before you do this, um, I want to read this scripture here in Second in, in Timothy. And it says, in Second Timothy verse 7, For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us a power, gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So... Let me ask you something. Write something down in your notebook or on your phone or your iPad or whatever you have. What's the thing that scares you the most about your job or your career, about starting a business after you graduate? What scares you the most? You got literally 10 seconds to write that down. Okay? What scares you the most? What, what are you afraid of? What's the fear, the biggest fear that you have regarding your job, your career, and building a business? Okay? Everyone done? You need to be done now. <laughs> now. Now look at it. Did that thought come from God? Where did it come from? It wasn't God, right? So, so if, if we are true disciples of Jesus, and we have the Holy Spirit that comes from God, we are like superheroes, okay, going out into this career force. And so that Spirit of God, that, that whatever fear that you had did not come from God. It came from the enemy. It came from your insecurity, your pride, your whatever it may be, sin. Right? And I want you to feel empowered with the spirit that God gave you. And that you can go into this job, this career, you're building a business, whatever it may be, and feel really powerful. Right? And, and, and a lot of the stuff that, that John and Carol had mentioned is so funny because gonna, I'm going to echo it in some sense. Uh, I have a saying in my agency. I own, a, I own an insurance agency. I, I got a degree in theater and dance. My life changed dramatically. I won't go into my life story. But um, I didn't know what I was doing. I was 22 years old with a theater and, theater and dance degree in my back pocket. I wasn't sure what to do. And, and God actually put insurance on my lap. I didn't grow up thinking I wanted to do that, but it worked. And, and it was a, it's one of the biggest blessings I've ever had in my life. And here I am, 22, trying to build a business with a theater dance degree. So I was acting like an insurance agent. <laughs> um, and, I was, and I was pretty good at it. Um, but, but we have a saying in our agency that we still do today. We do big deals. I mean, commercial deals, big financial things. I mean, it's, it, it's pretty big stuff. And I get fearful. And then I say this little mantra in my head that says, no fear except for God and God alone. No fear except for God and God alone. And that's the only type of fear that you should have because it's a healthy type of fear. Right? No fear except for God and God alone. And that, that prayer that, that, that I mention or that I, I say in my head a lot helps me pick up the phone, go through that meeting, do a speech, do a presentation, get the deal done. Right? And that spirit that you and I all share <laughs> is powerful. Do you believe in that scripture? So remember that thing that you wrote on your little iPad or your notebook? Why don't you scratch it out? Because it's not from God. Okay? Fear is from the enemy. The enemy is going to tell you. You see, the enemy doesn't come in the middle of the night and like these scary, uh, ugly faces and tries to haunt you. And I mean, because we think of the devil and Satan kind of like this, this horror film because we watch a lot of movies. Right? I'm a big movie buff. And, and, the, and, the, and Satan is like always like this scary guy. But you know what? I don't think he works that way. You know what he does? He gets in your head and he says, Damon, you're going to fail. You're not going to do good in your career. You're not good. You're not qualified. You didn't get the right degree, by the way. People are going to make fun of you. They're going to laugh at you. They're, you're going to get rejected. Right? And we get used. I'm very used to rejection. Right? And, and Leslie might even talk a little bit about it maybe later about rejection is a good thing. But the enemy will tell you that you're not good enough, that you're going to fail. You know, in Ephesians uh, 6, how it talks about put on the armor, the full armor of God. There's one little armor piece that I love, and it's the helmet of salvation. Right? And I might be totally, uh, I might have a different conviction on this, on this, and you may disagree with me, and that's okay. But why do, why do we put on a helmet? What, what is it protecting? Your brain. Your brain, which is operating your entire body, and it houses those thoughts, Right? And I feel like the enemy, he shoots arrows of thoughts 
that get inside your head that say you're not going to do well. Yeah. Don't go for that job. You're going to go for an interview? Dude, don't do it. You're going to say something stupid. And, you, and you, know, you put on that helmet of salvation that saves you, and it keeps the enemy from getting in your head. And you know what you need to do? Is be reading your Bible and learning and studying and memorizing that scripture in 2 Timothy about God having a spirit of power and not timidity. Don't be scared. Whatever your job, I don't know what your degrees are or what your futures are, but whatever it may be, God, you know, Jeremiah 29, 11, he, he's got great plans for you to prosper, right? Believe in that. And then what John was saying, but first seek him. You have to seek him with your whole heart. Um, so, and I think I even like Carol's little, uh, I didn't realize 5% was here and, and 95% is here. Um, and it's so funny because it was, I was about to say that you don't have to be the smartest, you don't have to be the strongest. There's this, another saying that we have, Charles Darwin. Uh, a lot of people uh, think that he wasn't a Christian. He didn't believe in God because he, was, he wrote the author, The Origin of Species, right? And so evolution had to do with exclusivity of not believing in God. Well, he actually believed in God, believe it or not. And he ended that book. Have you actually ever read it? Has anyone ever read it? Oh, I love you. So he ends the book. Most people remember him as, as uh, the survival of the fittest. Well, when he ends it, he doesn't say that. He summarizes that. He says it's not the strongest who will survive. It's not the smartest who will survive. It's those that are willing to adapt to change will not only survive but thrive. Okay, and they talk about these two butterflies in Canada. I'm probably messing this up. Where there's two species, and and it was a big, huge climate change that happened in that in that tundra area, and and one butterfly grew an extra layer of fur, and the other one, the other species of butterflies didn't, and then that one died out, and the one that grew that extra layer of fur was able to survive, but also multiply gangbusters. I mean, these these, these butterflies went everywhere, and so to me, it's not even a spiritual. Uh, practice, it's, it's, it's like nature, it's science, it's fact. That means that whatever you're at in your job or whatever facet that you're exploring in with school, you don't have to be smart. And, and I, that encourages me because I'm not the smartest guy. I'm definitely not the strongest guy. He is very strong. I'm pretty strong. But <laughs> I'm not the strongest guy. I'm not the strongest guy. Um, and you're the best looking baby. Oh, thanks, baby. Oh. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> um, but I'm definitely not this. Yeah, John's pretty strong. We go on these things called mancation. Oh, man. John will do circles around you. But, but here's what's really cool is that you don't have to. Who? Raise your hand if you think you're smart. Raise your hand if you think you're strong. Raise both hands if you love change in your life. Wow. wow. See, I was surprised. That's Most right. people don't lot like change. They, they stick to a pattern, and they don't like it to be disrupted. And, and how am I doing on time? I'm actually, I think I might be done. So, um, so that's, that's the thing I want you to embrace, is that whatever you're at, uh, Blockbuster. You guys remember them? Oh, yeah. They did not adapt. Uh, there's different companies and corporations, and if I had more time, I'd go through it. But, but talk about... In your, in your, whatever your career you're doing, think about rather, what are the things that you're going to need to do to adapt and change? Because the world's going to change even more. It's changing rapidly. If you're in computers, good night. That thing's changing by the second. If you're in healthcare, that's changing. You got to be willing to embrace that change that's going to be coming. And if you do that, don't worry about being smart. Don't worry about being strong. Embrace the change and watch your career excel. Um, I had another point, but I think I'm done. I'm going to let my wife talk. Um, and uh, let her let her follow. Go. Right. Um, and I just have to brag on my husband for a really quick second. He is incredible. He is an amazing husband, an amazing father, an amazing disciple. Um, but he recently he's amazing at his job. And he this in the next like three months he will be earning us two to three trips through his work because they're honoring him for being the top. I think like 2% in the nation at what he does with his company. Um, so he is excellent, and it's because of his character, but I just want to thank John, too, uh, for saying that I can go into the kitchen and just wash one dish. <laughs> so, um, okay. <laughs> you heard it publicly. He said it, and I will obey. Um, okay, so these are the spiritual guys share scripture with you. I'm just going to share some statistics with you. Um, and I'm going to talk more just about going from college into the workforce. Um, so who here knows 
nationwide in the U.S., what is the overall unemployment rate right now? Does anyone know? Very clear. Yeah, it's about 4.3% as of this month or last month, right? So who knows? You guys are millennials. So who knows what the unemployment rate is for millennials right now? It's about double that, 8.8%, which is actually down right now from about 12 to almost 13%. But to give you some hope, which is actually kind of sad, but um, does anyone know what the unemployment rate, the youth unemployment rate is in countries like Spain or France or Greece or Italy? It's anywhere from around 24 to 39% as of this month. So you guys are actually okay. I know there's been some like, ah, millennials trying to get into the workforce and it's so hard and they're, they're saying you know that we need experience but they won't give us experience because they won't hire us. But you guys are okay. You're going to get a job but there are some things that you need to know that are specific to your generation um, that you need to kind of adapt as Marcus was saying to be able to work and, and to work your way into the workforce. So um, and I want to tell you guys I have been there. My story is actually it's funny listening to your story because we grew, I mean, we kind of did this at the same time. It's sort of similar. I will say I got a theater degree from the most awesome university in the United States. Um, yeah! <laughs> UT Austin. Um, I got a theater degree. And then after that, what's that? <laughs> yes. Where's the microphone, by the way? Can everyone hear me? <laughs> okay, just kidding. I know I'm loud. Um, I got a theater degree. And then after college, I spent one year as an intern in the ministry. I wanted to be in the full-time ministry. After a year, they let me go. So I could not even stay employed by our church people, okay? So then I went into the workforce looking for a job with a theater degree and one year of experience as a ministry intern. I wasn't even a minister, okay? I was an intern. So I was not exactly entering the workforce on like strong footing, okay? Um, long story short, I started a business. Um, life changed. We had a family. And now I, I work with a, a company, a health and wellness company. Uh, and own my company, own a business with them and for five years now. And that's going uh, very well. Love it. Uh, but I just want to give you guys some tips as you're graduating from college or will be graduating soon and entering the workforce. Maybe some tips that are a little specific to millennials. Um, my first tip is, number one, temporarily lower your expectations. So, and what I mean by that is you, you guys, your, your people, your millennials, you kind of have a reputation for coming into the workforce, leaving college with an overabundance of confidence, but unrealistic expectations of the kind of job and work that you can get and salary that you can get even. So I want to encourage you to be willing to settle a little bit and take a job perhaps that isn't your dream job while you build the skill set that you need for your dream job. And there are skills that you need that are expected in the workforce that they don't teach at the university. Things simply like work ethic. Your work ethic, and, and it's actually super interesting. Uh, Carol and I work with a group of millennials and we work with a whole bunch of other people that are not millennials. We've had to educate ourselves with how to communicate and work with millennials because you guys are, um, you work differently. Um, and so going into the workforce, you're going to need to learn to adapt and learn work ethic, learn how, what is expected of you. It's Work ethic is different from being lazy, right? Lazy was is not wanting to work. Work ethic is you need to learn how to work, right? Uh, things like just personal discipline, time management, interpersonal relationships. So you need to build these skills. But be willing to lower your expectations. Number two, when you go into an interview, don't talk about yourself and what you're going to bring to the job. Instead, talk, I'm sorry, don't talk about yourself and what you hope to get out of the job. Instead, talk about what you hope to bring to the job. Talk about the company, about the business, and how you hope to contribute, okay? Number three, um, put down the iPhone. <laughs> put down the device. So the average person in America spends about three hours in front of a screen every day. The average millennial spends a lot more time. But you guys are in this room or you're listening to this recording, uh, because you do not want to be average. And I encourage you, do not be average. You are sons and daughters of the Most High, the all-powerful God Almighty. And you need to go into our world, you need to go into the world and do great, huge, big things for God, but you will not do those things being average. So you need to, if the average person 
average spends three hours a day in front of a device, you need to be, and by the way, I have nothing against technology. I love technology. I do. I think it's a tool, and I believe it's a tool that we can use even to build the kingdom. But I do, what I am against is wasting time. And if you just um, don't choose, and if you're not deliberate about the time that you spend in front of screens, you will get to your mid-30s or 40s one day, and, and you will not be where you want to be in your career, and you're going to say, where did the time go, right? So you want to choose to be a person that instead of saying, where did the time go, you tell time where to go. So you make a decision deliberately of how you're going to spend your time. So if the average person spends three hours in front of screens, you're going to say, okay, I'm going to be disciplined. I'm going to spend an hour and a half. And then I'm going to spend the other an hour and a half building my skills. I'm going to network with other professionals. I'm going to get a mentor. I'm going to read. You need to read at least 20 minutes of a personal development book every day in addition to your spiritual studies. Um, okay, so learn a language in that time too. Learn Chinese. <laughs> or learn a skill, maybe even a written code that's going to help you in your industry. Um, spend 20 minutes a day learning a skill. Uh, the, third, the fourth thing is thank you notes. For every appointment, every meeting, every interview you have, you are, need to write a thank you card. And just a practical tip is have the card already written out, have the address on there, have the stamp ready to go, and have it in your car. Go to your meeting, get back to the car, write the thank you card, and then put it in the mailbox on your way home. Um, and then number five, I just want to say a quick um, shout out to my sisters. Uh, so sisters, um, women in America make on average 76 cents on, the, on, on a man's dollar. And there's lots to that, but you know the number one reason why that is? It's because we don't ask for more money. Oh. And so I, I feel very strongly that as women, we need to ask. Uh, because you cannot give in abundance unless you live in abundance, right? So every time you are negotiating your salary for a new job, and every time you're in the job, you need to go negotiate your salary. And they will not pull back a job offer. It's not like they're saying, hey, we're going to give you this much. And you say, hey, okay, I'd like to re-look re at this and how about this much. They're not going to say, oh, you're getting greedy. No, <laughs> no longer, you're no longer, you know. You're, you need to negotiate your salary. And if you don't know how to do that, find someone in your life, a mentor, that can help you to do that. Um, and then number six. Number six, goals. Really quickly, I just want to share with you, and you need to look it up, because I'm going to do this quickly. Look up this study done on Harvard graduates about goal setting. You need to have very specific goals that are written down that you spend time every day praying over, um, thinking over. There's a great book called Visioneering. can't remember who it's by. Um, Andy Stanley, see these guys read. Visioneering is a great book. Um, but here's, here's the, uh, the, the quick Harvard study. They took a, a survey, I can't remember how many people, of these Harvard graduates, and 84% of them had no specific goals at all. 13% of them had goals, but they were not committed to paper. 3% of them had clear, written goals and plans to accomplish them. So not just goals, but a plan on how to accomplish them. Ten years later, they revisited that class of graduates. The 13% of the class who had goals were earning, on average, twice as much as the 84% of them who had no goals at all. And then here's even more staggering. The 3% who had clear, written goals were earning, on average, 10 times as much as the other 97% put together. Write down your goals. Make them crystal clear and continue to look over them um, weekly, if not daily. Um, and then lastly, just to wrap up, I just want to share, um, I have a mentor in my business, and her name is Cecilia Stoll. She's the number one income earner in my company. And just to give you an idea of what that means, her success, she is now, because of the business that she's built, she's now able to give away more money, to tithe and give more money every month than she and her husband used to make combined all year long. So that's the kind of success that she's had, right? And so um, I want to share two things with you that she shared with me. The first thing is build big. Go big. You guys, your daddy is the God Almighty. Anything is possible. Um, and I will say, too, we kind of come to these classes and we're, we're looking for the secrets of success. But the secrets of success don't work unless you do. 
But when you get to work and when you start building your business and you start building your career, build it big. You want to build a huge business so that you have a huge platform on which to influence others. And the second thing is uh, there are millions in the world, millions, who do not have the opportunity that you guys have to work and to make an income. And those millions are counting on your extra, your little bit of extra. So how dare you not build it big? Those are her words to me that I'm passing on to you, hopefully in love. So um, live in abundance so that you can give in abundance. Um, so be humble, be hungry, and hustle. It's another book you should read. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Lizzie. Yay! All right, I'm going to wrap it up here, uh, and if we got some time and you guys want to stick around, we can do a little bit of Q&A. Uh, there's a lot more stories, a lot more anecdotes, a lot more uh, lessons we've learned uh, through the school of hard knocks along the way, but I wanted to, to close up with this scripture here in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Uh, and it's short, which I like because it makes it easy to memorize. 2 Timothy 6 verse 6 says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. So we've talked a lot about how to excel in your career and how to go after it. And honestly, there's a lot more we could tell you about how to negotiate a higher salary, how to you know interview, how to do these other things. But quite frankly, a lot of that you'll figure out. You're welcome to come ask us afterwards. But if you're dedicated to God and you're, and you're faithful and you're willing to conquer your fears, you're willing to put in that little bit of, of extra work each day, you'll figure out a lot of these lessons yourselves. But the one thing I don't want us to go away from is that God wants you to be rich because that's not really the gospel. You know, the gospel is that you are saved already and you're here to make an impact for the world, for, for Christ in the world. And godliness with contentment is great gain. Uh, I, I'll tell you, the, the darkest times in my heart were the times whenever I would be tempted to look and go, man, what if I had just gone straight into engineering instead of gone into the ministry first? You know, what if I had just stayed in Austin and taken that cushy job and, and you know, whatever. But in the end, I had to stop and go, I am happy with the choices I made. I made them faithfully. And I saw people, even in my ministry, that had made faithful choices, but then years later, let fear and doubt sink in, and they regretted those choices. That they made faithfully, and it rotted their, their faith. So... Godliness with contentment is great gain because God doesn't necessarily say, hey, look, if you live according to these principles, you're going to be blessed financially or you're going to have the career that you wanted. I'm not doing the job that I set out to do, whether I, you know, in engineering or after I graduated. I'm, I, but I'm, I'm content with what I have because it's godliness with contentment that is great gain. Uh, I'll also say that you know, whatever you make, make sure that you dedicate your money to God. Uh, one thing I didn't share earlier that I meant to was when we got laid off from the ministry, I mean, again, we were in a very expensive city, had very few savings, and we had to go get jobs right away. We started cutting every expense we could. No eating out, cut the cable, you know, we had to keep the home internet going so that way we could keep applying for jobs, but I could forget all the other little expenses we went through, and we slashed our budget down to almost nothing. But one thing we didn't change, we kept our tithe as though we were making a full-time salary. And... For, for five, six months, we were giving way more than 10% because we were barely making it by, but we were faithful that if we keep giving, then, then God's going to open up the doors of blessing for us. And I feel like if nothing else, if there's anything that I did, I mean, I, I feel like the, the job I have now is almost entirely up to God, that He led me down a path that I didn't see, doors I didn't necessarily want to open, but if there's anything that I did, it's that I was faithful with my money as well as with my heart in what I did. So uh, if we can leave you with that, then, then uh, that's the one lesson that I really want you guys to get. There's tons of practicals, but be dedicated to God and be faithful about your choices and not fearful. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you guys very much for your time. And uh, if, if you guys want, we can stick around. We've got about 10 more minutes left. We could have some, some Q&A. All right. Coming in back. Question. Yeah. Actually, I don't have a question. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say, because I know these two people very well. And what I did want to say, and every, well, most of everything they said was true. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've all been best friends for a very long time. But what I want to say is, both of these couples, what they didn't say is, Marcos and Leslie, how many do they, they excel in their job, and God has blessed them. They also serve, and you saw Marcos up 
electronics, playing keyboards. They also serve in our, in our music ministry, yeah. and they have three children. Yeah. It's not like they just said, okay, we're just going to go give everything, and we're going to do great in our careers to, to, to glorify for God, and that, that they have done. They have also continued to serve the kingdom. Mm -hmm. John Carroll has served tirelessly uh, leading our team ministry. And if you have been teens or have ever worked with team ministry, you know what kind of work that is. It's a lot of work. And they also have three children, and they serve in our teams. And prayerfully, this fall, they will start serving again, part-time, in the ministry. Oh, we're excited about that. Um, but in, in doing that, cutting back even in their careers, not giving as much, because they want to give to God. And first and foremost, God has been, and the kingdom has been first and foremost in both of their hearts. And I'm going to stop before I start crying. <laughs> it's a long conference. I'm tired. <laughs> but I'm very grateful for them because they have been faithful. With, with little in the beginning, and God has given them much. And not just in financial terms, but in their relationships and the way they live for the kingdom and our church here in Austin. So I just wanted to say that. They did not pay me to say that. <laughs> Although, you know, you know where I live. Good so. <laughs> 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 Twix. She gets I Twix. Think, uh, yeah, it is Actually, it's up to question. They absolutely Thanks. give and serve God's kingdom. I love it. Amen. Thank you. Plus, the other thing that John didn't say is that. Um, so, if you guys are if you guys are entrepreneurs or even think about that, um, John has been able, like he said, he's employees, right? But all his employees are actually disciples. Um, but the cool thing that I don't, if you guys know, uh, we start had a mission team to College Station. For those of you from not from here, that's A and M. Um, but one of the guys that was that went on the mission team there. He, it's hard to get a job in College Station, okay? It's very difficult because there's not a whole lot of jobs other than college. teaching and college, right? So for him, he was able to give a, a guy a job that could work from home, and basically we are able to help the church there because he was able to have a job. So even thinking that way, like you could, you, what you do is powerful. You can help the kingdom in so many different ways. Don't be like stuck in a box because God has so much that he can do through you and through the other people that are around you that it's, it's really amazing. So just think about like how you can influence others and even your success will help other people know God. Um, because I think, you know, successful people aren't going to listen to me if I'm like just some random whatever person, right? But if I'm successful, they're going to listen to me. And so if God gives you that ability to be successful, be successful for him and let it be sh let it be shown so that you can help other people that are even successful get to know God, and they can help other people too. Mm -hmm. So, whatever you do, do it for God. Amen. All right, I got yeah. two two yeah. quicks. I'm curious if there's any uh, questions that you guys have, and you cannot be afraid. <laughs> no to fear. Ask questions. Yes. Um, so I recently graduated in May, and so the reason Congratulations. I was in Texas a couple years ago was. Torn between your degree and, yeah, and what you're kind of hit. Like, what's actually like, um, like uh, getting me through? What's your degree? Development. Well, I, I mean, <laughs> you guys can comment. I feel like God's more of a dream breaker than a dream maker, and and I don't mean that to be. And actually, it's a good thing. Like, mm -hmm. He gives you better, bigger dreams. I. All the way up until my senior year in college, I was going to be an actor. My sister was living in Hollywood, actually doing hair and makeup for uh, Paramount. And I had, a, I had a sofa there waiting for me to, to, to move into. Um, and then, boom, God kind of disrupted all that, but in a good way. And now I have bigger dreams. And so, pray, mm -hmm. ask advice, wisdom. I mean, it could be that you do end up doing something in your degree, by all means. Um, and, and you said you, you're getting your license in insurance as well? No, I got it. That's why I'm going to take it. You got your license in insurance? Yeah. Cool. 
Very cool. Well, maybe we can talk a little bit afterwards. But but at the but the bigger <laughs> heart of that um, is really you know what is God's will for you, and it may be within your degree. It may not. I don't think any one of us are doing the things that we got nope. a degree in, and that's okay. You got to be at peace with that. And and some people are right. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's mm-hmm. plenty of folks that do that. But I want to say there might be a better, bigger percentage of people mm-hmm. that actually don't do a career in the degree that they actually got. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and that's okay. Welcome to normal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, you guys. Yeah. Are- I mean, that's actually one of the the points I kind of cut from my lesson was basically just leave room for the spirit because you don't know where God's going to take you, what what He has plans for you. But I like the idea that the dream breaker is that I mean, I'm not doing what I thought I was going to do, um, but in a much better way like uh, I mean if I had just gone to school and gotten my engineering degree I literally would have just put my head down I would have been a happy faithful disciple just putting my head down going to work you know uh, 50 60 hours a week at an engineering firm and just making my salary and supporting the church and just living my life but I feel like God had bigger plans for me and if and I had to keep in step with the spirit and take a few faithful steps that scared me um, I mean, honestly, the main reason I picked to go into the ministry was because I was like, I was scared of, um, I was scared of public speaking. Uh, I was scared uh, that that God might have me move somewhere I didn't want to move, and I was scared that I would get laid off. Uh, all three of those things happened in like the first three years of being in the ministry. I mean, the public speaking thing I kind of foresaw, um, but uh, but in the end, like I couldn't sit there and go like everything else about this I feel called to. The only reasons not to is fear. And so, I mean, there, I, I just felt like the Spirit led. And, like, now I'm back in more of an engineering-style career, but it's just you got to leave room for the Spirit to take you where you need to go. And don't worry about whether you're doing what you should be doing, because I don't know if that's really... Uh, like, when I, when I was unemployed for, for six months, the thought that, like, I was doing my quiet times, and the thought that kept coming up was, like, the Garden of Eden, where God created Adam and Eve, and... It really, and I think that's life. Like, the Garden of Eden was like, hey, eat whatever you want except for the one tree. And sometimes we think, like, God says, he's got a tree planned for me for Wednesday, a different one for Thursday, or, or you know, whatever. Like, we think it's this, this exact path he's got laid out. Really, it's like, do whatever makes you happy. Just stay out of the, the stuff that I know is not good for you, you know? And so I think that's, that's leaving room for the spirit in your career. Can I ask, oh, I'm sorry. Can I ask, do you want to do... Uh, have a career in, in the field that your major was in? Um, or are you just thinking financially that would be more beneficial? Um, that my major is in? Yes. So, um, I actually really like the career field of social services, but I also like the insurance part. That's like, that took like, I don't know, two weeks, and I, and I, you know, I didn't have <laughs> I know, isn't that funny? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Well, I will tell you, you can build a great career in insurance. But if you if you want, I mean, like if you if you if you're created by God to be able to work with people in a different way, you know, with the what did you say your career was? Uh, development. Like social services. Like social services. Okay, so that's totally serving people in a different way. I will say, my husband, who is in insurance and financial services, he totally serves people, and he shares his faith with his customers. I mean, you can serve if you're a disciple in whatever industry that you're in. And I will say it's a financially rewarding career, although I will say it's a lot more financially rewarding if you own insurance down the road, owning your own company. And everyone should think about entrepreneurship versus being an employee. I strongly encourage you to have your own business, but... Um, just one more question. I'm sorry. sorry. Yeah, it actually had to do with... And I just want to thank you with um, oh, all thanks. your vulnerability and just like sharing your dreams and stuff. But... Um, yeah, with someone who wanted to like, who wants to start their own business and entrepreneurship, like, awesome. what do you recommend? I mean, I'm only 20. I'm graduating next semester, so I'm kind of like, not really know. And mm-hmm. um, my dad owns his own business, but he's not a disciple, so I just wanted to like see your input on like how to give it to God and like um, just like what are some small steps of advice. What kind of business do you want to run? Um, probably a farm. <laughs> that's oh, awesome. that's nice. cool. Yeah. Yeah. Where are you no, from? Where are you from? Sorry. Um, food. I'm from California. I'm a vegan. So. Awesome. <laughs> okay, well, I like that. 
Yeah. I've always said, um, you know, when people ask me why I became an, uh, an insurance agent, I always say you're asking the wrong question. The first question is why do you want to be a business owner? And then what type of business do you want to be? Yeah. And then you choose, if it's insurance, you know, which type of company you want to represent. But, so you, you first start with do you want to be a business owner? And I think all of us would say yes because we've been there and we see that we write our own paychecks. I've signed the front of checks, I've signed the back of checks too, right? So it's, it, it, is, it is more risk, but with more risk there's more reward. Um, so I think there's a lot of advice that we could, there's probably, I could spend five more days talking to you. Um, but if it's owning a farming business that has natural vegan produce, right? Am I, am I going down the right direction? Yeah. Then, then I don't know that industry. And I think you, you need to do what you know and, you, and that you're also passionate about. Um, and then it ends up being a joy instead of labor. And so I think you're in that right direction. And then I think it's being able to talk to, men, as someone had mentioned, getting mentors, mm -hmm. mentors that are in that industry yeah. Yeah. and grabbing onto them and say, I want to know what you do and I want to follow you and I want to see what you do and then absorb that and then also maybe critique it. There might be something they do that you're going to do differently. Um, so that's where I would start. Yeah. I think at this point we'll, we'll wrap it up, yeah. um, but we're going to stick around, so come, come talk to us. We, we got